Telemax highlights. And here's your host, Louise Houghton. Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. It's been a packed week here in Europe, so here are our favourite stories that we wanted to share with you on the show. Future Vision. We look at how architects are trying to make cities greener. Dreamlike imagery. Swedish artist Eric Johansson and his surreal pictures. And prolific writer, Irish, Irish author Cecilia Ahern publishes her 13th book. Increasing the greenery in city centres is an environmental challenge that many architects are trying to address. Amongst the many projects cropping up around Europe is one by Italian architect Luciano Pia. He's developed a sustainable building called 25 Green in the middle of the Italian city of Turin. And this sees residents living in a kind of tree house. A green urban treehouse of sorts, the Venti Cinque Verdi apartment building in an ordinary residential area of Turin. 115 pots containing different kinds of trees are scattered over all five stories. It's architect Luciano Pia's vision of ecological architecture. We tried to keep the materials as natural as possible. Materials that are mostly untreated, so they age and mature with the passage of time, such as natural larch wood and the steel that rusts and gradually changes its appearance. Combined with the green and the trees, it has an attractive coherence. Another example of green architecture can be found in Milan. Two high-rise buildings called the Bosco Verticale, or Vertical Forest, by the architect Stefano Boeri. They won the 2014 International High-Rise Award. In Paris, landscape artist Patrick Blanc has been designing vertical gardens for buildings' facades for over 10 years. His living walls also inhabit the Quai Branly Museum, designed by Jean Nouvel. But it takes more than green facades to make truly green, sustainable architecture. From the holistic point of view, sustainable building goes much farther than green building. It includes social and cultural aspects and the whole gamut of economic issues and efficient construction, environment and the quality management systems. So it's not just about purely ecological questions. Venti Cinque Verdi's courtyard encompasses a little forest of some 50 trees. They enrich the air with oxygen and keep it cool in summer with their shade. In winter, after they drop their leaves, they let sunlight through to the apartments below. I designed the building to consume less energy. It's very well insulated and protected from the sun during the summer. The windows are very big, so they let a great deal of light in. And that lets people save electricity as well. We collect all the rainwater for the plants, and we use energy-saving geothermal energy for heating and cooling. Alexander Rodolfi from the German Sustainable Building Council appreciates the Venti Cinque Verde project, but he doesn't believe we'll all be living in buildings like this in 30 years' time. I think problems of an economic nature will develop. I think the building is very maintenance intensive. We'll have to come up with other solutions to provide high quality living space at affordable rents. But as a pilot project, a one-off, it does an outstanding job. But I don't think we should take it as our model for architecture of the future. But the residents enjoy living among the trees and greenery. Each of the 63 apartments has a floor plan of its own. Welcome to my house. Uh, one of the main reasons for which I bought this house is, is this uh, window you can see here. When you see this, uh, these windows open, you can feel outside and inside the apartment being in the same place. The simplest where to live, where to share your time with your family and friends. I love this house because I feel myself uh, inside a little environment but at the same time at the, at the center of the, of the city of Turin and I feel myself inside the, the nature. 
The Chano Pia is already involved in other projects, a hotel for the renowned Juventus Turin Soccer Club. It will also sport plenty of green. Venticinque Verdi is a project that's meant to be provocative. All the green in and around the building and the steel structures imitating nature are meant to get people ready for a far more extensive inclusion of greenery in buildings of the future. The Venticinque Verdi residential complex is a unique piece of architecture and an inspiration for future projects. It's already a must-see for architecture fans and students from all over. The idea could well be inspiration for the Swedish retouch photographer Erik Johansson. He's always blurring the line between reality and fantasy with his fascinating illusions that have people questioning the image for hours on end. His trick is to head out with his camera and photo the real world, then layer the pictures back home on a computer. This process can sometimes take months per shot, and he gave us a behind-the-scenes look at how it's done. What is reality? And what is pure fantasy? Is this a real photo? From the real world? Strange places, combined with bizarre dimensions. These are the works of Swedish photographer Erik Johansson. Each picture begins with a simple sketch on paper. When it's finished, Johansson knows what motifs he needs to photograph. Uh, to me, coming up with ideas is a lot about trying to find a connection between two things that normally don't really go together. I try to... Um, to use materials that uh, can be quite different, but somehow find a transition to make them come together in a nice way. Several months often pass between the sketch and the final picture. What's most important to Johansson is that every detail seems as real as possible. And he spares no effort in pursuing that goal. And in the end, the illusion is perfect. I always liked drawing ever since I was a kid, but I, I always had a big interest in computers as well. And when I got my first digital camera when I was 15, I thought that that was the first time that I could actually combine those interests and, uh, and create something new with, with, with the pictures. After spending four years in Berlin, he has now moved to Prague. He says he can work just about anywhere, and moving allows Johansson to reinvent himself again and again. I think the culture of a place can affect my work as well. Uh, I think it's interesting just to, anything you see can be used in form of inspiration to, to create a new product. So I don't know in what way, but I'm sure that Prague will give me a lot of new ideas. Johansson finds inspiration everywhere in his surroundings, including in the powerful contrasts between man-made objects and nature. Sometimes he accepts commissions from international companies. Today is the first time he's worked in his new studio in Prague. He likes to keep his older works in sight. Because sometimes he finds a detail he'd like to improve sometime in the future. The day when I will be completely happy with my work, I think then I'm done. We always have to keep moving and always become better. And I still feel like I have a lot of ideas I want to do. For his new project, a piece of the puzzle is still missing. A pair of scissors that's destined to be the central object in the picture. So starting with the sky, then building it up with the background, with the foreground, taking down the saturation a bit. This is about where I want the sky to be cut up, open. Uh, we have the girl here, and she will be carrying this that we just photographed. Johansson works on several hundred layers in Photoshop at the same time, and inserts the photo of the scissors. Eric Johansson travels around the world to achieve the perfect illusion. 
His home country, Sweden, frequently turns up in his surreal landscapes. If the season doesn't correspond to the idea for his picture, then the project has to wait till the year rolls around. The crux is that everything should appear as real as possible. Except when it doesn't. Germany's GQ Men of the Year Awards took place this week. Amongst the winners were tennis coach Boris Becker, pianist Lang Lang and some of this country's most famous actors. But what did it take to receive this kind of accolade? Well, our reporter took to the red carpet to try and get some tips from the winners. And here they are, the Men of the Year. Danish bad guy Mats Mikkelsen, German actor Daniel Brühl, and veteran singer Tom Jones. Plus, yours truly, Euromax reporter Hendrik Welling. Although strangely, I'm not among the winners. But why? What do I need to have to become man of the year? Perhaps I can get some tips from the jury. Taken from the editorial team at the German edition of Man's Lifestyle magazine GQ. Once a year we celebrate men who have achieved something special over the last 12 months. Men who also in general bring a bit of style to their field of activity. So are 2015's top dogs alpha males or more the nice guy next door? Macho or metrosexual? These days, one in three in Germany are unsure how to present themselves to women. Are beards out? Muscles back in? It's enough to make you want to have a lie down and consult a shrink. But back in the real world, what do people on the streets of Berlin reckon makes a man? He has to be nice. Smart. Reliable. A strong character. He has to be elegant. Faithful. Sense of humor. Depth. In French we would say galon. Empathetic. I guess strong, charming, show up themselves, make good money. A real man. <laughs> and to discover the real man in me, I go to see John Eigner, profession personal coach for men. Technique, getting the subject to confront himself, literally. Clichéd categories of men play only a secondary role. A major factor is being your own man and having self-confidence. Being a man with a feeling of freedom and a bit of a wild side. A man who wants to go out and have an adventure. John has me assume a range of postures in front of the mirror. According to his theory, your pose is linked to your self-awareness. Body language goes inward and outward, so you can use it. You might want to have your legs a little further apart, your hands out of your pockets. Right, in terms of body language, you're a new man. For me, it's like wearing armor. Exactly, and the important thing is you feel that. You feel it from the inside. And I feel the need to look a bit meaner. Go for it. Back to the red carpet at GQ's Man of the Year Gala. And now I see if it also works on the red carpet. Will the photographers and camera teams notice me? Could you imagine me as one of the Man of the Year? It was funny to walk the red carpet, but to be honest, it was very hard to get the attention of the photographers. But hey, was Tom Jones on the red carpet? Maybe I should get some advice from the ones who ought to know. If you want to be, if you want to become a man of the year like I am, then you have to sing. But I can't sing. Well, then you have to do something else. You have to be true to yourself first. You have to believe in yourself. And I think if you do, confidence is uh, is very important. I think if you're confident within yourself, it shows. It's important for men not to take themselves too seriously and not always be proving their masculinity. He should be a man uh, very gentle to women, very kind to women. Not all of them are kind to women. 
Are you? Sure. I think you're doing pretty well. You're wearing a tuxedo and your bow tie is fairly straight. That's a good start. Yeah, we shouldn't listen to that. We should be who we are. And, and in the end of the day, hopefully that's enough. I think a man has to be a gentleman, and I think he has to be hardworking and passionate about what he does, but also a man who gives back. The man of the year. Even if I don't get a prize, I remain true to myself and display self-confidence. I'm sure that puts me close to being a man of the year. Well, if it was the Women of the Year Awards, then Irish writer Cecilia Ahern should be nominated. She shot to fame with the publication of her first novel, P.S. I Love You, back in 2004. After 11 years with international fan base and 13 books now on sale, the world really is her oyster. But she has no desire to leave her hometown on the Irish coast. Malahide. A small coastal town with a population of 13,000. 20 kilometers northeast of Dublin. This harbor town is home to best-selling author Cecilia Ahern. She's lived here all her life. Growing up beside the sea, any time I'm, I'm not near it, I feel quite suffocated. So, um, yeah, the sea is very inspiring and it, it's, just go, it's just, it's good for the mind to go and uh, let my mind wander. Most of Cecilia Ahern's books are set in the north of Ireland, and so is her latest novel, The Marble Collector. It's the story of the relationship between a father and a daughter. It's about a young woman named Sabrina who stumbles across a collection of marbles in her father's private possessions, and she realizes that some of the collection are missing. So she goes on this mission to try and find the missing marbles. But as she goes on this journey, she discovers that her dad has lived a very private life. He's got a very, he's got a lot of secrets that she's uncovering. Um, and it becomes less about looking for missing marbles and more about trying to discover who her dad was. The Marble Collector is her first family saga spanning several decades. It's not the usual love story, but one that still fits her style. But Ahern's initial idea was completely different. It was just supposed to be a short story. I realized it was going to be something much bigger than that. Um, and the more I learned about marbles and the more I, I got into the marble world, I realized it was just such a beautiful setting for a novel. And I think they just look so beautiful. They're like tiny little universes trapped in, in, in a piece of glass. And I thought that um, it, uh, they very much inspired the story. You know, each chapter is named after either a marble game or the name of a marble. And um, it just, I just thought it was a lovely, a lovely world. So far, Cecilia has published 12 books, all of them in print runs of millions. Family is always one of the basic themes. Cecilia says her talent is treating serious themes with a light touch. I always want my stories to be really hopeful. So I'll deal with loss, but I want them to find their way. Um, and and I'll, I'll write about something sad, but I want to inject it with a lot of humor. So I like to balance the darkness and the light and the sadness and the humor and the loss and the finding. So um, yeah, it's definitely my, my calling card <laughs> if I have one. <laughs> her best-selling debut novel, P.S. I Love You, made her an instant and worldwide success at age 21. The book's been translated into 15 languages and was published in 50 countries. Now 34, she's received many awards for her prolific work. Most of her readers are women. And Germany is her biggest fan base. Some critics might call her novels kitsch, but millions like the books precisely for their emotional quality. When I'm writing, I have to feel everything I'm writing. If I'm writing something sad, I'm actually crying. If I'm writing something funny, I need to be laughing. And I think that's what the readers get out of the books. They feel they can connect with the characters and, and the journeys that they're on. Cecilia Ahern, a writer who entertains and charms, and not just with her books. While talking of entertainment, let's finish the show today with a look at a new musical that recently premiered in Dortmund.
The show is about a Protestant reformer, Martin Luther, and boasts a modern-day mix of rock, ballads, soul and gospel music. Organisers say that it's designed to appeal to those who don't normally associate with the church as well as practising Christians, but some have said that churchgoers might find it hard to accept. Nevertheless, it is a vast extravaganza that was packed out on opening night. It's opening night for a very special work in Dortmund. And the star of the show is spelled out big. The work is called Pop Oratorio. The subject is Martin Luther, widely considered the father of the Protestant Reformation. Saturday marked the 498th anniversary of the clergyman's historic break with the Catholic Church. The project includes a lay choir with over 3,000 people from the local area. That feeling is good. It's a nice feeling. For a choir, it's not about knowing whether you can do it, but that you can do it. You need the confidence that you can do what you've been rehearsing. Almost 500 years ago, Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the castle church door in Wittenberg. But the work centers on a different event, Luther's summons to appear before the Holy Roman Emperor in Worms. Hamburg-based musical star Frank Winkels plays Luther. At the hearing in Worms, Luther was in essence put on trial for heresy. He survived only thanks to friends in high places. The pop oratorio was composed by Dieter Falk. The basement of his studio in Dusseldorf is adorned with over 50 gold and platinum discs. Falk is one of the most successful producers on the German music scene. The word message is a bit over the top. We're not the electronic church from South Carolina. We're not interested in doing some big Bible show. We want to tell an exciting story about a person who had an impact on society, both here and around the world. The members of the choir began meeting for rehearsals several months ago. The libretto was written by Michel Kunze. He's been following the production every step of the way, including both choir and soloist rehearsals. Kunze has provided the lyrics for a range of chart-topping hits and popular musicals. What we wanted to do is to create an event that isn't fusty and old-fashioned, that isn't classically traditional, one that doesn't put on airs. We wanted to make it an upbeat evening of pop and rock, where the music shows the audience that these issues are still important to all of our lives. There were two shows on that first day, both to an almost sold-out crowd of nearly 8,000. My family are up there, my son's singing, so it's a special thrill. It's a great and modern musical, but we'd have preferred historical costumes. Very appealing. For young people, too. I like it. Wie gefällt das? 
ich finde das auch nicht sehr gut. It's good to see church themes being presented to a large audience. It's something you don't see often enough. Ich denke, es wird zu selten gemacht. The performers got a standing ovation. In 2017, the 500th anniversary of the beginning of the Reformation, the Pop Oratorio will tour Germany. And that wraps up our highlights of the week. So thanks for being with us. And until next time, take care of yourselves and goodbye. Peace.